Welcome to Defining Dad Bod, where we work to untangle the messy knots of the health and fitness industry as if your children's lives depended on it. Because they do. This is where we decide to make our bodies stand for something bigger than ourselves. This is where we find practical wisdom to live by, one powerful conversation at a time. May the words spoken here inspire you to keep moving forward no matter where you are. Who knows who you could be if you could become 1% better every single day. We can do the show thanks to the support of listeners just like you. For more information how you can become part of the inner circle, go to findingdadbod.com slash inner circle. What's up, guys? This is Alex Van Houten with Defining Dadbot. I hope you're doing super well. I'm very excited about today's show as we continue our True Fit series and build on the conversation about how we can create long-term sustainable health and fitness rather than just short-term changes here in 2020. Today is unabashedly for somebody starting a weight loss journey. Up until this point, every part of this series could be applied to a beginner or even a veteran. In fact, last week's episode, The Hero's Journey, was much more applicable to somebody who's been doing health and fitness for a while but doesn't want to feel like they're going through the motions. So if you're not a beginner and you missed that one, go check it out. But today's episode deals with a conversation that I've had over and over and over again when I work with people who have long-term weight loss goals. You see, weight loss, especially sustainable, practical weight loss, is a very complicated conversation since so many factors play into the initial adaptations of change that happen in someone's body. So it's possible that they could do everything right keep their food journal, make the changes required, exercise regularly, and eight weeks into their program, sure, their energy's a little better, and their clothes fit a little better, and they're starting to feel stronger in their workouts, but the number on the scale hasn't changed. And there's a lot of reasons why that's important, and why, biologically speaking, the lack of change on the scale is actually a good thing, and if you just stick it out, you'll see some great results. Before we dive into that conversation, I want to personally invite you to join the Defining Dad Bod Inner Circle. Here in 2020, if you're committed to long-term, sustainable health and fitness, then I argue there's no better place to be than in a place where people are working to become 1% better every single day, and will encourage you to do the same. Also, Inner Circle members get live access to our Q&A on the last Saturday of every month. So here in January, that would be this coming Saturday on the 25th. I have several questions submitted by Inner Circle members already that I'm excited to answer. And if you're there live, I'll make sure you get your questions answered too. Go to definingdadbod.com slash inner circle. It takes two minutes to connect and we'd love to have you there. Also, I want to give a big shout out to Russell and John, who this month stepped up in support of Defining Dad Bod and made a monthly pledge. You guys rock. I appreciate you. And to those of you who've requested more information but haven't pulled the trigger yet, I really appreciate your consideration. It's because of the support of listeners just like you that we can put out unbought, unbiased, practical, and science-based information that helps to motivate people to stick with it, to make positive change in their life, and to pass on a legacy of health and fitness to their kids and their community. I love to be able to share with you what I've learned by working in the health and fitness industry for over 14 years, and I appreciate your help in paying to keep it online. If you find our work valuable and you'd like to keep the podcast free and accessible to anybody who wants to hear it, you can find the links to different methods of contributing below. Or if you don't mind the delay of a personal email, you can shoot me a message for more information at coachal at definingdadbod.com. Thank you for your support. We really appreciate it. My team and I appreciate it, and they don't know it yet. But somebody who needed to hear this message today, the one about not stopping your nutrition and exercise program, even though the numbers on the scale haven't changed yet, they appreciate you too. So without further ado, let's get to why you haven't lost weight yet and why that's not a bad thing. So you're in the initial phases of a new long-term health and fitness goal. Awesome job. I'm proud of you. If you tuned in last week, we talked about the hero's journey. And whether you're just starting on a health and fitness journey for yourself, or you've been doing this for a while and you're pursuing a new goal, there's some things you need to know about the initial phases of your journey. And so I've spent some time going over conversations that I've had in my 14 years of training experience to help people navigate that first 12 weeks of initial adaptations. And lucky for you, I've boiled it down to five pro tips in starting this journey well. 
So I hope you're excited. These five things have helped more people than I can count, including myself, to cash in on the motivating factor of a new journey while sustaining that motivation and changing it into inspiration for the long haul. And knowing these five things could be the difference between you actually seeing this journey through or giving up on it when most people also give up on it. So here we go. These are the five things you need to know when starting the process of pursuing a new goal. First, if you want to start your journey well, you need to invest in some injury prevention. Nothing quite derails a hero's journey like an injury, especially if the journey itself is one that's physical in nature. I know a thing or two about this, because being involved in sports and events since I was very small, but also dealing with hypermobile joints means that I've played the injury cycle game way more times than I'd like to count. You're training for a marathon, and you sprain your ankle on the 12th week of your training cycle. Well, that really throws a wrench in your plans. You're trying to do a pull-up, and your shoulder starts to bother you, and it doesn't go away the next day. You're working on the shape of your abs, and then your neck starts to hurt, and you feel pain kind of shooting down your arm. Or maybe you're working to PR your deadlift, but now your lower back starts to bother you, and forget deadlifting, tying your shoes is really hard. The list of ways that you can injure the human body goes on and on. And so when you're starting a health and fitness journey, it's important that you take measures to prevent injuries before they happen, and reduce the risk that you're going to be set back by one. There is no humanly possible way that anybody can guarantee you won't be injured on your health and fitness journey. In fact, as a bipedal primate moving around in Earth's gravity, it's only a matter of time before you get hurt in some form or fashion, especially if there are kids and toys involved. Seriously, is it just me, or were Legos designed to cause the maximum amount of pain when stepped on without a puncture wound? Seriously though, injury prevention is going to be a huge part of beginning your journey well. And while covering that in full would take several episodes in and of itself, here are a few things that I recommend to my clients in the very initial phases of training to help them prevent injuries in the future. First of all, focused intention on your movements in resistance training so that you're using the right muscle groups and so that you are present with your body is paramountly important. I would rather have 12 focused and intentional push-ups with core engaged great breathing, great range of motion of the pectoral muscles, shoulders out of your ears and lats engaged, then 30 push-ups that are done without breathing, with your hips sagging, shoulders riding up in your ears, and the movement more in your triceps than your chest. One of the things you need to know about your health and fitness journey regarding exercise is that injuries compound when focus decreases. If you're feeling distracted today or mentally exhausted, what you need to do in your workouts is take things down a notch so that you can increase your focus. The most extraordinary athletes of our time, who've spent tens of thousands of hours mastering their craft, would report in a sports psychology setting that their best performance in workouts or best performance on the field hinges not on nutrition, not on recovery and rest, but focus. Chances are, if you're listening to the sound of my voice, you're not an elite athlete. But if it's that important for them, it's even more important for you. If you find yourself drifting off in your own mind from your workouts, or the podcast you're listening to is just really interesting, or maybe the environment you're in is very distracting, I need you to take a deep breath, recenter yourself in your workout, focus on the movement at hand, do it well, and listen to your body while you do it. Most injuries happen when you're not paying attention. Another aspect of injury prevention is ensuring that your muscles and your nerve cells have the ions that they need to flex and contract appropriately. For many people, that's as simple as working a magnesium biglycinate supplement into your regimen. That's not super important in the first two or three weeks of exercise, but what you'll notice is if you are magnesium deficient, you'll increase tightness over a short period of time, and magnesium is the ion that your muscles require in order to relax. There are several other side benefits of this, but I find this is a hugely important part of injury prevention in the initial phases of training. Picture this. You have muscle tissue that's anchored to the bone on either side of the muscle tissue, like it's a long rope, and it's tied to the bone itself. The place that it's tied is called a tendon, and tendons recover very slowly compared to muscles. In the initial phases of training, your muscles will gain strength very quickly because there's a lot of cells in the muscle that help it recover quickly. Tendons, on the other hand, have very low cellular density, and so they don't recover as fast. One of the causes of injury in the initial phases of training is the muscle getting so strong, so fast, and so tight all the time that it's continually pulling on the tendons and not allowing them to recover. If that's the case for you, then after three, four, maybe even five weeks of continual exercise, you'll start experiencing one of the itises. Plantar fasciitis, elbow tendonitis. 
Itis simply means the inflammation of. And for many people starting a new workout program, the tightness in their muscles and the lack of their ability to recover their tendons because of that tightness is what will shoot them in the foot in the early phases of training. Haha, <laughs> see what I did there? Plantar fasciitis, shoot you in the foot. For this reason, you've probably heard many people recommend stretching in order to help you increase the flexibility of your muscles. I covered flexibility in full a while back in episode 48, and you're welcome to go check that episode out if you're interested in some of the nuances of improving your flexibility. Long story short, it's pretty complicated, but one of the simple ways that you can improve the flexibility of your muscle tissue over time is ensuring that you're not magnesium deficient. And in addition to having great focus and ensuring that you're not magnesium deficient in order to reduce muscle tightness, it's important to properly rest your muscle before progressing through the phases of training. When I was 19, I got into climbing pretty heavily. I loved it so much. I'd harness up, I'd put the rope on, and I'd hit my favorite routes over and over and over again on the wall. I got so into it that by three weeks, I had been climbing almost every single day for 30 minutes to an hour at a time. I was young and in pretty great shape, so while it was a workout, I didn't think much of it. But then I started developing pain in my hands and my wrists, a little bit of pain in my elbows, and then my shoulders. For the most part, I was fine throughout the day, but after five minutes of climbing, everything burned and ached. No biggie, that's what they make ibuprofen for, right? You pop the ibuprofen, you mask the inflammation, and you get to do what you love some more. Well, the joke was on me at 19 because that's what we call a degenerating gain. If you're on a long-term health and fitness journey, your job is to play toward adaptations in your body rather than degradations of your body. That means that you stress the system out and then you let it rest. And in the rest, it becomes stronger than it was before and then you get to do that again. What I'm saying to you is if you're in the beginning phases of training, don't get gung-ho and work the same muscle groups over and over and over again throughout the week. On average, if you're new to training, most modalities require about three days to recover fully from them, and you're not going to see a very significant improvement in your results if you work things out more often than that. So how does that look? Perhaps you start with a lower body day and do some foundational exercises for your lower body, and then you do an upper body day and do some foundational exercises for your upper body, and then you have a day devoted to cardiovascular exercise and some core training, and then you have a full rest day. And then let's say that you repeat that pattern for a few weeks. What's nice about that is now your muscle groups have several days of rest before you work them again, but you're maintaining the habit and consistency of approaching your exercise practice every day. Some of my newer gung-ho clients will be like, oh, I see there's a rest day on Wednesday. Can I just do some cardio instead? And oftentimes I have to tell them, no, the rest day activities are there for a reason. Let your body recover and stop breaking down your tissues, because if we're in this for the long haul, we need to be building you up, not breaking you down. And so if you're at the beginning of the journey and you're working to prevent injuries, then ensuring enough rest in between repeating the same activity is paramountly important. My 30-year-old self would go back in time and tell my 19-year-old self, you can climb on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. You're in great shape, you recover quickly, but your body still needs rest to adapt. Trust me, in six weeks, you'll thank me because you won't have to take an entire three months break to make your wrists, elbows, and shoulders happy. Be smarter than I was and give yourself enough rest between workouts. So that's pro tip one, injury prevention. Focus, magnesium, and rest. So let's move on to pro tip two. If you're starting a long-term journey, don't start with nutrition changes. Start with nutrition journaling. Here's a common mistake I see in the fitness industry. The new year rolls around. Somebody says, man, I'm finally committed. I'm going to join the gym and I'm going to change my nutrition for the better. And so they do all of that at once. They add a protein shake. They stop eating ice cream before bed. They stop eating fast food. They don't drink Diet Coke. And they're at the gym every day in January. It's pretty powerful. They see some great results. And so they keep that wagon train moving. But then something at work or at home happens in February or March. And they get off their routine. And by April, it's like they never made a change to begin with. They're not working out anymore. They've got ice cream back in their diet before bed every night. And if you ask them how it's going, they'll say, I fell off the wagon, man. Here's the deal. If you're going to make long-term changes to your nutrition, you can't change a lot of things overnight and expect them to stick. Many people don't realize that you have been eating for almost as many hours in your life as you have been sleeping. You spent more time buying your food, preparing your food, cooking your food, eating your food, and cleaning up after your food than you have playing with your kids watching TV, and maybe even getting paid for your job. And what I'm saying to you is, food is a habit. And the only way that you can change a habit over time is by becoming aware of the habit and then replacing that habit with newer functional actions and practicing it over time. 
I've covered this in the show before, but this is the fundamental reason why just giving you a meal plan is not going to help you. Meal plans can be great to serve as an ideal to help you understand what a great week looks like. Oh, so that's how you incorporate vegetables into breakfast regularly. Oh, so that's how you get protein at every meal. Oh, those are healthy snack options. But if I handed you a meal plan and I said, all right, I want you to eat like this every day, don't deviate. Not only can many people not do that, but even if you could, that meal plan isn't a habit yet. It's just something you're doing for the short term. And so if you intend to change anything about your nutrition on this long journey of health and fitness, you cannot overestimate your ability to tyrannize your habits. Maybe sometime on the show I'll even work to cover some of the psychology around food, like rewarding yourself with a treat, or what it means to have a comfort food. But for now, I want you to know that if you're going to make long-term changes, don't start with several nutrition changes, but instead, start with becoming aware of the habits themselves and being truthful with yourself about what you're putting in your face every day. Whether you're working with a professional or you're the only one in your corner, a food journal is the first long-term step toward making nutrition changes. If you're in this for the long haul, it's not important that you make lots of changes now it's important that you make the changes that are going to stick with you. So start with the awareness of a food journal. Our next tip, tip number three, if you want to make this journey a long-term journey, goes out especially to somebody who has a weight loss goal. More specifically, a fat loss goal. Because I'm sure if I asked whether or not you wanted to lose some muscle, or if you were interested in getting some fat to come off of you, most everybody with a weight loss goal would say, no, 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 let's keep the muscle around, but I'd like to lose some fat anyway. There are a couple things you need to know about the initial stages of a great weight loss journey. And if you don't know them, you could become discouraged relatively quickly and give up on your goal altogether. See, when you first begin an exercise program, there are many adaptations that happen in your body that will actually cause you to gain weight, not lose it. However, these adaptations shouldn't be thought of as bad things. In fact, if you have a long-term weight loss journey, the initial adaptations to a great training program will help you to lose weight faster in the long run and will help you to keep it off when you reach a point that you're happy with your weight. I've mentioned several of these adaptations in earlier shows and in different conversations, but I don't know if I've ever put them all together in one succinct paragraph for you. So here they go. If you're just starting a new exercise program, several things that will happen that will add weight to you. First, your blood volume will increase. Any good cardiovascular program is going to ask your body to get good at moving oxygen throughout the body. In order to do so, you need greater lung capacity, you need your heart to be stronger, but you also need increased amounts of blood flowing through your body. And so a great workout program will actually add a pound or two to you just in blood volume. And that's a very powerful and important adaptation that you need to carry into the next several weeks if you're going to lose weight sustainably. In fact, I argue that it's the most important adaptation in the initial stages of training. Since without oxygen, you are unable to burn fat as a fuel source at all at the level of your mitochondria. And so being able to move that oxygen throughout the body is one of the most important keys to using your fat stores as a fuel source and thereby decreasing fat in terms of body composition. The other adaptation you need to know about is moving your water weight from extracellular water to intracellular water. If you haven't been exercising lately, chances are you have dormant metabolic tissue, that is, unused muscle tissue, that's just hanging around and hopefully ready to be used when you do start exercising. But dormant tissue, what you can think of as sleeping, is not fully hydrated so that it doesn't have a whole lot of chemical reactions going on. And so when you do start an exercise program, one of the things that your body does is fills that dormant tissue with water so that you can start using it to perform your workouts better. I've tracked this process very closely with what's called an in-body, which is a medical-grade bioelectric impedance machine that can track how water enters and exits cellular tissue on a daily basis. And in tracking that, I've seen people in the first eight weeks of their exercise program gain eight pounds of muscle and lose eight pounds of fat. What happens if you, quote, gain eight pounds of muscle and lose eight pounds of fat? Well, the scale doesn't change, but the way your clothes fit changes, your energy level changes, your performance in your workouts changes, and that metabolically active tissue is actually going to burn more energy in the long term. And so once you've reached your maximum capacity for that metabolic tissue to be activated, you'll stop gaining weight and start losing weight because the fat is going to continue to come off. Now one point of clarity here, we're talking about the movement of water throughout the body, not necessarily the addition of muscle tissue to the body. 
This is important because athletic people who are trying to accumulate muscle tissue require nearly a month of very focused training in order to add a pound or two of muscle to their body. That's because they're actually trying to add more tissue, not just increase the water in the dormant tissue. It's a very different process from somebody who hasn't been exercising regularly, and I can't have somebody claiming that Alex Van Houten on Defining Dad Bod said that I could gain eight pounds of muscle in a month if I just did things correctly. But before I digress, Let's make sure that I summarize this. It's very important. If you're on a long-term weight loss journey and you have 10, 20, 30, maybe even more pounds that you'd like to lose, it's very possible that in the initial phases of exercise programming, you'll likely gain weight or even plateau for a while before you see long-term sustainable weight loss. It doesn't mean your program's not working. It doesn't mean that you're not doing it correctly. It means that during that time, you're going to have to focus on a few other measures to measure your progress, rather than weight. I'd been training about six years before I finally learned why it seemed almost magical that at around week 12 or maybe even week 16 for weight loss clients, that they started to lose the weight they wanted to lose, without having to further manipulate caloric expenditure. I'm ashamed to say that as a very young trainer, if my client didn't lose the weight they wanted to lose in the first four to six weeks, I'd advise them to drop their caloric intake and eat less, which definitely resulted in weight loss, but it wasn't very sustainable, since eating at a deficit for any long-term period of time can also lower thyroid hormone and some of the positive adaptations that we just finished talking about. Now, as a more seasoned trainer, I advise my clients to focus on their improved energy output, their improved performance in their workouts, their circumference measures, that is, are your waist and hips changing, even if the scale is not? And if we're seeing positive adaptations on all of those fronts, then healthy weight loss is sure to follow if they just stay the course. Don't get discouraged in your long-term journey because you don't understand the investment of the initial adaptations. The fourth pro tip to sustaining a long-term health and fitness journey is being proactive about marshalling accountability and support. Here's the deal. If you're on a long-term health and fitness journey, it's only a matter of time when the day comes that you don't have enough willpower to do this all by yourself. You're going to need a support system, and I promise you're going to want to have that support system in place before you meet the day that you run out of willpower. Support systems can take all forms and shapes, but they include things like a good running buddy or a good gym friend who's not going to blab a whole bunch instead of working out. It also takes the form of a supportive spouse. They don't necessarily need to be a health and fitness junkie in order to support you well, but I'll just say it takes the pressure off of meal planning when they're willing to eat the way you're eating, or maybe to help you limit the amount of chocolate chip cookies and alcohol is available in your house without making you feel bad about it. And then, in addition to the social side of things, there's the professional side of things. Where are you going to turn when you don't know what to do next? Who do you have to share your concerns with who's not necessarily affected in your day-to-day -day life? Oftentimes, in long-term health and fitness journeys, this is the role that I find myself playing for my clients the professional support system that helps them to navigate the space of accountability and intelligent programming. If you've ever watched a good boxing match, the athletes in the ring, throwing combinations, fainting left and right, and engaging toe-to-toe -to -toe in the battles that they've been training for. Oftentimes, you don't even see the coach in the camera at all. But if you turn the sound up, you can hear the coach in the corner of the ring hollering encouragement into the ear of the athlete and giving suggestions, looking at the big picture, so that the fighter's more effective in the moment. The boxer's doing all of the work, obviously, but the coach is making him more effective by keeping him focused on the prize and making intelligent moves in the moment when otherwise it would be hard to. And then when the round's over and the fighter gets a little bit of break between his next bout, he recovers a bit, he regroups, and the coach walks him through changes in strategy to make the most out of the next round. And then, if the fighter is very lucky, he's got some fans cheering in the stands who are yelling his name and truly want to see him succeed. And this is the reality of a powerful support system. If you're working toward a long-term health and fitness goal, you are fighting a battle. You could say you're fighting the clock. You could say you're fighting your job. Sometimes I'm even fighting myself in this journey. But your social support system, your fans in the stands, hopefully your spouse, maybe a battle buddy, maybe the other participants in the cycle class that you really like to go to. Them cheering your name when the going gets tough, celebrating when you win, and feeling the pain with you when you lose. And then the professional support of the coach in the corner who gives you intelligent advice and doesn't let you give up on yourself. The importance of those two support systems cannot be overstated. I've heard it in many consultations when I'm speaking with somebody else on the other side of the phone who's fighting a lot of the long-term health and fitness battles without a coach in their corner and no fans in the stands. And I'm not going to stand here and say that it's impossible to make progress under those conditions, but I am going to say it's much harder to get up without that support system when life throws you a right hook in the jaw.
if you want to make long-term health and fitness changes for yourself, take the time to bolster your support system. Get around other people who have similar interests as you, and consider the investment of a professional coach. Your fans and coach can't do the work for you, but there's a world of difference in knowing you're not alone in your fight. And last but not least, pro tip number six when you're starting on a long-term health and fitness journey. Doing anything is always better than doing nothing. I've worked with a lot of people who say, look, I know I should be exercising regularly. I'm just not really sure where to start. And they've heard and they've seen so many exercise videos and so much advice that they're suffering from paralysis by analysis. I work with people who are so afraid to do a plank because they're thinking of 13 things they heard they're supposed to do in their plank that they won't even get down there and attempt it for 30 seconds. Here's the thing. I'm 31 years old, and I'm still learning powerful cues to help me in some of the most basic exercises. That is to say, I've achieved a level of mastery in things like the pull-up, the push-up, the overhead press, the plank, the bird dog. But I can work with a coach who's been training just as long as I have, and they can still teach me a thing or two about doing it well. What am I saying? Nobody exercises perfectly. And if the reason that you're not attempting some things is because you're worried about doing it wrong, then here's my advice. Do it slow, do it light, and do it in front of a camera. You're going to get better and more in tune with your body and in tune with the exercises over time, but it'll never happen without practice. People don't generally get injured because their plank form is wrong, or because while performing one of their squats very slowly and with intention in front of a camera, they drop too low and pop something in their knee. People usually get injured because they attempt something way more advanced than they're able to do, or they do so with exhausted muscles for too many reps. Start small, start light, start slowly, and work to improve over time. If you're really concerned about doing things wrong, then I highly recommend working with a trainer you trust so that they can inspire some action in you. I worked with a new client this morning who's been putting off weight training for the last eight months because honestly, as he said, he didn't really know where to start. After our session, he said, you know, we didn't do any exercises that I wasn't very familiar with, but I honestly wouldn't have made myself do them at all without you. He wasn't overly sore or strained, but it was a good workout and a great starting point, and we're going to progress over time together. And that's something you'll see in many phases of your fitness journey. In fact, if you're doing it right, you'll be exposed to something you're a little uncomfortable with and a little unsure of. And as long as you do that in a safe and positive way, then before you know it, you'll be expert at what you're up to. Just do it. That's what Nike says, and it's really not bad advice. A bad rough draft is better than no rough draft at all. And at least with one rough draft in hand, you can make some editorial decisions in the future. Similarly, just do the workout. Do some movements that you want to try. Do them badly. Learn from your mistakes. And if you feel very apprehensive or injurious about the whole thing, hire some professional help. You'll be surprised at how quickly you progress and how comfortable you get with knowing you're not an expert, but at least you're doing something positive for yourself. I'm still learning, and I hope you'll join me in that. We all gotta start somewhere. So there you have it. Five pro tips to starting and sustaining a long-term health and fitness journey. Invest some time and energy in injury prevention. Journal your food. Pay attention to, understand, and celebrate the initial adaptations of a weight loss journey. Be proactive about marshalling accountability and support. And lastly, don't be afraid to try new things and progress. We're all learning, and nobody's perfect. I hope these five things help you to begin this long-term health and fitness journey well and to keep yourself from succumbing to some sort of discouragement, especially while you're just getting started. This has been Alex Van Houten with Defining Dad Bod. Until next time, guys, kick butt, take names. The free practical advice and conversations here remain unbought and unbiased thanks to the support of listeners just like you. For more information on how you can become a part of the inner circle of Defining Dad Bod, go to definingdadbod.com slash inner circle.